She's an award-winning YouTuber and best-selling author obsessed with helping you go after the life you want. I like it. Join her as she seeks out the stories and strategies. Give me every little detail. Of extraordinary people who found success. I'm going to get emotional. Oh, my God. Welcome to Detail Therapy with Amy Landino. So I think if people are dealing with perfectionism, you have to set constraints on yourself. A lot of people think that constraints limit what you can do and actually hold you back, but they can actually, they're, they're a place where creativity can be found. So when a designer is designing for an iPad or an iPhone, they have that constraint of how big the screen is and it informs their design. In the same way in any creative pursuit, whether you're setting a deadline or saying which gear I should use, by limiting your constraints, you have to get creative to overcome those, those challenges. Good morning, good life. Welcome back to Detail Therapy. You just heard a little bit of my conversation with filmmaker, minimalist, and YouTube creator, Matt Diavella. In this episode, we're talking about what it actually means to be a minimalist how you can start to become one or use some of the tips that minimalists use to just pare down a little in your life and Matt's practical tips for dealing with perfectionism. We also go into what it's like to create on YouTube and anxiety and there is just a whole bunch of other stuff in here including his fandom for The Rock. We have a lot to get into today but for those of you who are new to the show my name is Amy Landino and I will be your host. I'm a YouTube creator, podcaster, business coach, public speaker, and best-selling author. I am here to help you go after the life that you want. You can find out more details about me at youtube.com slash Amy TV. I, I just am so pumped to bring this one to you today. This was such a treat to be able to stop and see Matt while we were in LA and do this interview. It was highly requested. So it's just awesome that, you know, it gets to happen and we're in season three and I feel like we're really bringing the heat with some awesome guests, just people that genuinely are doing the thing every day who are just going after the life they want and showing exactly how they do it. I really, really appreciate everyone's feedback on the details and the info and sending me questions for people. I'm always trying to let you know who's coming on the show next so you can potentially send me the questions you would have for them because I'm just the connector here. I'm the host. I connect you to the guest and I like to share a few of my thoughts as well. I'm really working on my interview skills. I don't know if you could tell, but... Um, you know, try not to interrupt people and stuff. It's about them, not about me. I know it takes practice, but it's definitely important to me that I ask the questions that are important to you, not just to me. I definitely have a few of my own. And I really only like talking to people that I find interesting because, you know, it has to be a little bit about me. Okay. All right. So we're all over the place with about who this is about, but regardless, I think you're really going to enjoy this chat with Matt Diabella. He is just such a talent and it's very important to kind of squash the overnight success thing that people feel about anyone because even in today's really crazy creative world where somebody could join YouTube and go viral after their first upload I don't know how it happens guys you know if you ask me how did somebody upload their first video on YouTube and have millions of views if I knew the answer to that question do you really really think that we would be in the situation we're in right now. No, I mean, it's just the nature of the craziness that is this world. And it is absolutely something to be excited about, not to be inhibited by, because it means that any of us have a chance at any time to hit it big, but you have to do the hard work to get there. You should assume that that's the case. Even if somebody like Matt, you know, has a YouTube channel for one year and sees incredible success really quickly. There was a lot of stuff that went into that. There was a lot of preparation. There was a lot of life experience. There was a lot of work that went into it. So I think that that's what we're going to talk about today and really bring that perspective to you. So with that, let's get into it with my chat with my next guest. Matt Diavella is a filmmaker, YouTuber, and podcaster that explores what it means to live a good life. 
And just like a good minimalist, that's his bio. Quick and easy one sentence. And I think it explains him really well. This was a highly requested interview, as I said. And, you know, it's I think because me and Matt are on similar missions in the YouTube space to help you live the life that you want. I'm really excited that we could sit down with him in his home in L.A. and have this chat for you. So, Matt, let's get into it. Matt Diavella, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Why do you do what you do? Oh, that's a, a big question. And I think it's uh, it comes down to it was the only thing I was good at uh, <laughs> when I was young and in you know high school. I tried to you know focus on math and science and all these other subjects, and I was just horrible at it. But filmmaking was the one thing that it was effortless. And it was the one thing that you had to pull me away from. So I'd be working, you know, during lunch hours, I'd be working during study hall hours after school, I'd always be making films just because it was the one thing that I was driven at the one thing I was excited to share with my family and friends. And I wasn't sure I was going to be able to make a living doing it just because uh, at least at that time, this was before the whole DSLR revolution before mm. YouTube even. Uh, and everybody told me that it was kind of tough to get in this industry, you know, to like Hollywood is the only place you can make films. And luckily, I just stuck with it. And uh, over time, it I eventually turned it into my job and career, which is something I'm always pinching myself over. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, what a lot of people know you for right now is your incredibly successful YouTube channel. And I, a lot of the success you've seen from there is, has been in what space of time? Oh, uh, a year. So that's like Ish. crazy, right? So there's these people that are probably thinking like, oh, overnight success again. Amazing. But for those that don't know, what what were you doing before YouTube, before your podcast? Like, what is this like the film stuff that you were focused on before that? Yeah. So like I said, uh, filmmaking was the one thing that I really focused on for most of my life starting in high school. And I started to work freelance and get some jobs in college as, as a freelance filmmaker. This was making weddings. It was bar mitzvahs. I was working with I was doing local TV commercials. There was one time when I was this was like kind of a I made it moment. And this was like very early in my career. But I was at the gym uh, on the treadmill and I look up and I see uh, this horrible commercial that I had made for like a local hardware store. Really? But those were the kind of videos I was working on and I was excited to do it. Uh, and but I was basically just putting in my reps. I was just getting as good as I possibly could at filmmaking and trying to put everything I had into these videos. So I never thought like, ah, it's just a bar mitzvah video. So I'm just going to phone it in. It was, you know, I'm going to this is a really important video for this kid. It's something he's going to be able to have for the rest of his life. So I just put everything I had into it. I put special effects into the videos uh, and I just kept making and kept learning and kept growing. And I was uh, primarily focused on like the entrepreneurial business side of things as well. Like I think it was it's important to have both those sides when you're getting started out. And so I, I just kept going at it. And then I eventually grew my business to be able to get to the point where I was ready to make another step, another challenge. Mm -hmm. And that was when I went out and shot my first documentary, which is called Minimalism. And that was the first original project that I made. Uh, and we were lucky enough that it did pretty well and, and a decent amount of people saw it to where it gave me the motivation to want to start the YouTube channel. Mm. But it was 10 years of making films until I got to the point where I was ready to start a YouTube channel. Were you a minimalist at the time? How did the inspiration behind that first documentary come about? Yeah. So minimalism is something that I found when I moved home to live with my parents. Mm -hmm. So I graduated college with $97,000 in student loan debt. Then I did the smartest thing I could think of at the time, which was to buy a brand new car. Of course. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, as you do. So now I'm like $115,000, $120,000 in debt, <sighs> just overwhelmed. And I felt like I was a complete failure. I just moved in literally into my parents' basement and... I was seeing all my friends go out to get their starting jobs with starting salaries. They all seemed to be happy and to be doing well, going out to happy hour. And I was at home in my parents' basement, just in debt. Like, what is wrong with my life right now? And then I saw this interview with a guy named Tom Shadiak. And he's an amazing, brilliant director. He's directed all these great Jim Carrey comedies, mm. like Bruce Almighty from, mm, and all these other such comedies. A good one. Yeah, back in the 90s. Uh, and he basically was telling his story about how he got everything he thought he was supposed to have, everything he ever wanted, moved into this massive mansion, 10,000 square foot mansion. And then when he moved in, he realized that 
he wasn't happy. And he's like, this is why did why was I chasing after this? This is all the things people were telling me I should have, right. but I actually didn't want it. So then he moved into a tiny trailer park home in Malibu. And I was like, you can do that. That's like a path that you could take. You can actually get rid of your stuff to live in, in a smaller space and you can you know, give a lot of your money away and, and focus on a simpler life. And then that's when my perspective started to change. And I started to hear about all these other people who were practicing minimalism. Josh and Ryan from The Minimalists mm. uh, were one of the early ones that I came across. And so then I just jumped in and it was easy for me because I didn't have a whole lot of stuff. I had, you know, I threw maybe 80 percent of my clothes into a donation pile and then I got rid of the stuff nobody would take. And I gave away old guitars and other, you know, baseballs and memorabilia that I had from when I was a kid. And I became a minimalist. <laughs> and it was uh, it was kind of like for me, it was an internally profound thing to happen. But for people around me, for family and friends, uh, they might not have noticed the difference. Mm. Um, but it what do was, you mean by that? Um, I think it, it's one of those things where it's like becoming a vegan. You, d- you don't exactly want to run around and tell all your family and friends you're a vegan. I know people who do this. Though. Yeah, especially my <laughs> Italian family, because they would just make fun of me over dinner right. uh, as I like chew on my tofu. So I just decided, you know, I'm going to keep this to myself. Uh, obviously, like, you know, they might have noticed differences in my demeanor and I how see. I approach things and certain conversations. But for the most part, it was like it was a very personal thing to me. Yeah. And I didn't feel like I needed to go out and tell everybody about it. Uh, and then it was shortly after that that I ended up getting connected with Josh and Ryan from The Minimalist, guys who helped inspire me to get into the movement. And that's when this whole documentary came about. And that's when we decided to tell the story of minimalism today. Not a new idea, but uh, a new retelling of it. So I don't know if this is a stupid question or not, but do you, is there like a one sentence guideline that helps describe exactly what a minimalist is? Like something that helps you to determine I, I have a minimalistic lifestyle versus, oh, it, we're starting to have too many things. Like, how do you how do you know you're you're a minimalist, I guess? That's a great question. I should have definitely I should definitely prepare a one sentence <laughs> summary of minimalism because given the topic, to given the topic, it seems like something that's relevant. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> My friend Josh has a nice quippy saying. He says minimalism is the thing that gets us past the thing so we can focus on life's most important things, mm. which aren't things at all. <laughs> a lot of things. But uh for me, it's about living an intentional life. It's about asking the really difficult questions about where we want to go with our lives. Obviously, it starts with the things for a lot of people. We have a lot of clutter. We have junk drawers. We have cabinets filled with stuff, attics and basements filled with crap that we don't use and we never look at. And it can be overwhelming. So we say, OK, let's declutter. Let's like Marie Kondo this and get rid of. Is that a pop? We get a pop. Yep, we got a there. pop for that <laughs> okay, one. Yep. Great. Um, <laughs> Let's let's just let's get control of our house and the stuff that are, that's in it. But then once we do that, we move past it. We realize, oh, we have a lot more time. Mm-hmm. We're not spending all our time taking care of our things, cleaning it, reoiling it, repainting it, all the things we have to do to care for our stuff. Then we can focus on what kind of life do I want to live? Uh, what do I want to do for my career? What kind of people do I want to surround myself with? And those are really difficult questions that take a lot of time to answer. And I think it'd be overwhelming for people when they first start thinking about it, because in a lot of ways, the things can distract us from asking those questions. Like, what do I want to do with my life? And if you don't know that answer, it can be crippling to approach it. Do you have any advice for somebody that's like, all right, I love this. I'm going to start minimalizing right now. So what can I do to get rid of all my things? What were some of the things that you did when you were like, okay, let's start sorting through this stuff? Were you throwing things out? Were you donating? Was there, Were you selling things? Like, What are some of the tactics? That yeah, you I think that those are definitely the three main things that yeah. you would want to focus on. You can either sell, donate, or throw it out if nobody wants it at all. Obviously, in terms of trying to be sustainable, we don't want to throw out a bunch of crap and just throw it in the landfill somewhere. So if we can find other people that can take it off our hands, even better. I suggest starting in the closet. I think that's a really great place to start because it's so easy to find that shirt that you haven't worn in three years. And maybe look at the clothes that you haven't worn in the past 14 months um, obviously you want to take into account the fact that seasons change and you'll need different clothes throughout the year, but 
for most people, I think it would be very easy to find at least 50, probably up to 80% of the clothes in your closet that you do not use at all. You do not wear at all. And that's actually, I mean, people laugh now and people ask me all the time where I get my shirt from. And it's because I only have one shirt. <laughs> I have, well, I have 10, I have 12 different pairs of the same exact shirt. Wow. I have, because it's my favorite shirt. And yeah. I was just like looking at my closet, like this is a shirt I go to every time it's clean. Why don't I just go, why don't I just buy a bunch of them? Yeah. And then I, so I have one pair of pants, one pair of jeans and I have like very minimal wardrobe. Um, but I think what people will find is you don't have to go to that extreme. Right. Uh, especially I'm sure the women listening to this podcast are like, that's not going to happen. <laughs> Although Courtney Carver has an amazing project called Project 333, where she encourages people to live on 33 items for three months. And that's definitely one of those. Uh, it's not something you have to do forever. Sure. It's not a forever decision, but you put everything else in a box and then you just see that it's actually not that bad to live on a few amount of items. Uh, and so I, I think anybody can, will be able to notice that as they start to pare down, especially in the wardrobe, how much simpler their days can start, how much easier it is to, to get up and get out of the house when you're not having to rifle through a hundred options right. and instead you're just looking at 10. Yeah. There is something so big about the lack of multiple decisions, especially to start your day with something like choosing your outfit, but the amount of things that are around you all the time that are causing you to make decisions. Like, do I stop mm -hmm. and take care of that? Do I stop and clean that? Oh, I have to do something with that. I need to make a decision about it. It seems like minimalism is connected to limiting unnecessary decisions. hundred percent. Yeah. And we get deci decision fatigue as well mm. throughout the day. There's only so many decisions that we can make. Anybody who's gone to Ikea knows this. By the time you get to like the toiletry section and the throw pillows, you're, you just throw your hands up and you're like, I just can't, I can't do another. I can't figure out which pillow that I want to buy. Uh, my wife and I joke that they should have count. Uh, couples therapy at the end of the Ikea aisle. It should be the last <laughs> section. And it's it, because making decisions is taxing, it's difficult, and there's only so many that we can make in a day. And when we are we are dedicating our lives to something meaningful, a creative pursuit, uh, we want to make sure that we can focus all our energy in the right places and we're not wasting time making decisions about which bowl we should use or which cup we should use. Uh, and we yeah. should have those decisions be made from the very beginning. I love that. I'm thinking about all the coffee mugs I've accumulated over so long and I'm like, oh, I don't even like them anymore. So many it's like they're staring me in the face like this one's too big. This one isn't good enough. This is and I'm just like, OK, is that the one thing? good coffee mug, you guys? Why are there so many coffee mugs? My I parents have about 300 coffee mugs. And it also it's self-inflicted. It's totally self-inflicted. Yeah. Actually, there was a time where I told my audience I wanted coffee mugs for my birthday and they actually listened to me and they oh all came goodness. in the mail. And I was like, oh, my God, there's so many. That's so funny. <laughs> Let's go back to. Uh, when you were starting the YouTube channel, I mean, even even beyond that, how much time are you spending in the video creation process? You've created such incredible content. I think stuff that's really changing people's minds about what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, how much time is it taking you to make one video? Thank you uh, for that. I really appreciate it. It's it's definitely been a lot of work. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't have a team, so it's just myself working on these videos. And that's how it's been since the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because I, I really love it. I love the whole process. And I'm not as interested in saying, hey, let me hire, let me like build out a whole team. Let me get four editors and then we can make eight videos a right. week and all this stuff. And I'm more interested in making very intentional videos, a short amount of videos. I'm not trying to do too much with it. I'm just trying to do enough and make the films that I'm passionate about and I think will help people. But any given video, the amount of time I'm spending on it will vary. But if it's very laborious, it might be two to three days of editing, one or two days of shooting, like a solid week just working on one video. But there are those other videos that I could probably put together in about two days. Mm. And it really depends on what I'm trying to make. And I think one thing that I'm personally working on is overcoming perfectionism. And one way that I did that recently was to set a very finite constraint on the work that I do. So one, setting a deadline saying, mm -hmm. okay, I'm only going to allow myself one day to shoot one day to edit. And that's it. Like I, by the end of the second day, I have to have a video done and I have to cut it, export it. And that's it. Uh, and that pushed me. And then I also limited the amount of gear that I could use. Mm -hmm. So even as a minimalist, I have tons of filmmaking gear, lots of lenses, so many different things to choose from. So on this trip that I took, when I decided to make this video, I just brought 
uh, my Sony camera, one lens. I brought the microphone for on top of the camera and batteries. And wow. A, and then a memory card. And that's it. And I was like, okay, let's see what I can do with this. So I think if people are dealing with perfectionism, you have to set constraints on yourself. A lot of people think that constraints limit what you can do and actually hold you back. But they can actually, they're, they're a place where creativity can be found. So when a designer is designing for an iPad or an iPhone, they have mm -hmm. that constraint of how big the screen is and it informs their design. And the same way in any creative pursuit, whether you're setting a deadline or saying which gear I should use, by limiting your constraints, you have to get creative to overcome those, those challenges. What would you say to somebody who's inspired by what you're doing and wants to get going on YouTube today? Would you give, what advice would you give to somebody who's brand new into this and wants to actually create great content? Be patient. Mm -hmm. It's going to take a while. And that's one thing that I certainly struggled with early on. Uh, growth was never quick enough. Mm. And I always felt like, oh, I needed to get there. I need to get to this place. Once I get to 15,000 subscribers, that's it. Then I'm going to be so, I'm, it's going to be perfect. I'm going to be content. And it's going to be so much easier to do my job very quickly. If you're lucky enough, you'll pass that milestone. And then it's what's next? What's next? What's next? Uh, and you have to be patient and enjoy the process. And like, it's one of those things that I think people have to learn for themselves yeah. in making our documentary. Uh, there, it was a grind towards the very end. And even a documentary about intentional living and minimalism and, and mindfulness, I still found myself working 10, 12 hour days, just grinding it out, editing this thing, doing as much work as I possibly could in a short period of time. Um, but I think if looking back on it, I wish that I enjoyed the process more. And I enjoyed the moments where I, w I didn't make it or I wasn't having any success uh, because you're never going to feel like you've gotten there. Mm. Uh, even now that I, I have a larger YouTube channel, it's like I don't feel like I'm there. I don't feel like I've arrived. Uh, so I think that that's the one the, the myth of success is this idea that you think that there's going to be this end destination. And if you know from the beginning that it's not going to be there, I think that might help you enjoy the process a little bit more. Absolutely. I just something funny kind of occurred to me. Are you up to almost is it almost two million subscribers? Uh, one point six. One point yeah. six. OK, so have you received your um, one million plaque? I did. Yeah, it's in the closet. I was going right to say, there. like, did you keep it? Did you decide it was too much? Clutter? I got, I <laughs> I got rid of my 100,000 plaque. Yeah, I actually did. I did a little competition to give it away to like another oh. YouTuber. I don't I don't know why anybody would want that, though, because it says <laughs> my like, name on not it. Not yours. But it, for him, it was kind of like uh, to kind of encourage and push him to create his own YouTube channel. And mm. he was really stoked to get it. It was just a fun way to have a competition. And it was like, why not give this away? But I'm not going to lie. Like, I, I haven't hung it up yet. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to keep it. I thought I really wanted it, right? I was like, oh, that's good. It's, come on. That's a great milestone. That's really cool. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. But now, I don't know. People might get mad at me, but I'm like, I don't care about it. And like, it's, I don't, I don't want to create for 1.6 million subscribers. Like I want to create for zero. I kind of always, I, I like being the underdog. I like being able to like be, uh, kind of have to live up to something. And I want to kind of push myself further. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you should always feel like you have something to prove and you should always be putting yourself fully into it and you shouldn't be phoning it in. Uh, so I don't know if it's the best <laughs> reminder. And like, I just, I don't know. It just seems like self-indulgent too yeah. to put a trophy on your wall for yeah. it. I, I mean, I definitely hung mine up and I <laughs> I like the way it looks because it's silver and it matches my office pretty well. But other than that, it's not like I'm walking up to this thing and going, well, I did it. I have done something. <laughs> yeah. I think mostly my like when I have somebody come clean the house every once in a while, they see it and they're like, oh, this is interesting. Like, who is this person? And, yeah. that, and that makes me feel weird because then I'm like, oh, hi, like we don't speak the same language. And now you're reading this plaque on the yeah. wall. It's like kind of weird. But yeah, maybe, it's, it's very self-indulgent. Yeah, and Maybe it's the matching thing, too, though. I don't know if it. I don't, gold, it yeah, gold it's gold. It, I, I don't know if well. it does fit in here. I don't know. That's it? gold. <laughs> you have one, you have one little gold <laughs> detailing in this office. Yeah. <laughs> What's um something you've learned about being a YouTuber that kind of surprised you? Uh, it's a lot of work. Uh, you know what? And, and I work in self-development, so I'm making videos about um, how to live a better life, how to live mm -hmm. a good life, trying to give people advice and encouragement. And the full disclosure, I haven't completely figured it out yet myself. And a lot of the, the videos that I make are just about me learning and experimenting and trying new things. But I used to think that those that worked in self-development just 
what an amazing job because your whole life is just about improving your own life. Yeah. But it's it's really much more than that. And there's a lot of work that goes into making videos and the actual craft is filmmaking. And that's what I'm spending all my time doing. It's like in, in addition to like the writing and figuring out what I want to talk about and what topics to cover. Uh, the act of making videos, it can be strenuous. And like it, people talk about a lot, just burnout on YouTube. And it's very easy to compare yourself to other people and say, oh, this person's making three videos a week, four videos a week. I need to step it up and start making more stuff. And it's very easy to pull, pull yourself into that the same that way that we compare ourselves to others on Instagram. So I try to just be mindful of like, am I happy? Am I making enough for myself? Am I making enough money to pay my bills? Uh, if that's enough, then I need to be content with that and be happy with that because otherwise we can always chase after more and more and more. I think there's a lot of frustration that happens in the YouTube community, specifically when YouTube changes, uh, mm -hmm. that now we're kind of up in arms about what the algorithm's doing today. Is that something that ever bugs you, the algorithm and that arbitrariness of the algorithm and what it's doing with your videos and how things are changing? Do you ever consider that in your filmmaking or is it not that? I'm making the thing I want to make and we're going to put it out there. I, I think you have to pay attention to how well your videos are doing if you want to make a successful career out of uh, YouTube or creating content in general. That's kind of the, the part of the uh, recipe that's marketing, getting your idea out there. So coming up with a good title or a good thumbnail is a really important component to making videos on YouTube. In the beginning, I think I would have said like, ah, forget it, just do whatever your heart desires. Uh, but I think, you know, when you put 40 hours of work into a video, you want it to help people. You want people to see it so then they can learn from it. And uh, and you also want to continue to make a living and you want right. to be able to continue to do this. So I think it's 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 certainly a balance. Um, I, I don't think anybody would just I wouldn't advise anybody to upload a thumbnail that's completely black and just do video one, video two, video three. That will not work. <laughs> so there's definitely a balance there where uh, you don't want to go over the top sensational either. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to be genuine, whether, you know, you're you're making a thumbnail where you got a surprise face or you have a title that's uh, a little bit more intriguing. Mm. You have to find that right balance for yourself. But for me, it's just been. I, I try not to think about the algorithm. I'd be lying if I said that the numbers don't affect me from time to time. I try to just not look at them, just like negative feedback. Yeah. Uh, you have to just kind of remove yourself from the product after you've finished it, put it out into the world and say, it's not mine anymore. This is for, for other people now. And if you were to hold your, your well-being and your happiness dependent upon what other people thought of your videos or how well it performed, that's a recipe for disaster because yeah. you cannot control that. You can't control how many views it gets or how many people see it, uh, how many people like it or down uh, downvote it. Uh, so you just need to be happy with the fact that you did the absolute best that you could with the time you had to make the video. I think that's great advice. Definitely anybody thinking about being a creator in any sense should think about that because yeah. Sometimes the audience is there and you're excited and sometimes it's not your best day and you still have to be really happy with what you're doing and keep going forward. We talk a lot about morning routines on mm -hmm. this podcast. Before I actually get into the details of your day and um, all that kind of fun stuff here, how that looks for you, um, Jennifer from my Shine Squad actually asked an interesting question. She said that myself and you have different, if not opposing views on morning routine flow and even the importance of a consistent morning. So she thought it'd be interesting for us to get into the nitty gritty. And I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? So what are your views on morning routines and consistency on that level? And um, I wonder if we do have opposing views on it. Before we get into the details of our true feelings about morning routines, let's take a quick break. This episode of Detail Therapy is brought to you by Shine Squad. Shine Squad is my self-improvement sorority. We talk all about better morning tips, how to build confidence, and getting connected to people who can help you thrive. And we do a lot more than that. And there's actually been quite a bit of developments lately. Something that I've shared with Shine Squad is the writing process. So as I've been writing my second book, 
Good Morning, Good Life. I've been filling them in on these details. They asked to be a part of the process and I felt like there was nobody better to bounce ideas off of. Well, last year, those people who are in my top level, Shine Bright Like a Diamond, did a live training with me on the three guidelines I believe will help to shape a morning routine to start your day right. So whether you have 15 minutes or an hour and 15 minutes to spend on your morning time, these guidelines will help you launch into the day with your head in the right space. I'm not going to give it away here because this is literally the first time I've been sharing details of the actual book content with anyone. So of course I went to Shine Squad for that. And it's all about the small and incremental changes in your life that make a massive difference in your mindset, your productivity, your career, and your relationships that will help you. And this is why you would want to be a part of Shine Squad, not just to get the edge on my book, but also to continue to improve yourself every day by having the right people around you. And if you happen to like podcasts, which I have a feeling that you do, all levels of Shine Squad will get access to my five to 10 minute audio tips in our secret podcast posted every weekday. Sometimes I share Amazon purchases that I recommend, motivational advice, quotes of the day, and even secret podcast sessions with guests of detail therapy. So today, if you're in Shine Squad, you'll be able to hear Matt's secret podcast and also every secret podcast we've done in the past because you'll be in, you'll have the link and you can binge it all. Oh, by the way, major spoiler alert. Those people who are eligible today will be watching a live stream with me today, Tuesday, September 24th. And in that live stream, they are going to be hearing about a very big announcement. Something new is coming to Shine Squad. And if you're a small business or aspiring business or freelancer, you're going to be very excited. So go and find the perfect squad level for you at the official Shine Squad community page, patreon.com slash amytv. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash a-m-y-t-v. And I'll see you in the squad. Now back to Matt's thoughts on morning routines. Yeah, so I'm not a big morning routine guy. Like I, I'm the kind of guy that like I really want a morning routine. I just mm. know that I'm, the, I'm pretty type A with most things. So having a morning routine, you would think it would be something that I would actually be a big proponent of. But I just I generally just like to get to work. Like I don't like to have a whole lot of friction in my mornings. Mm. And like since I love what I do and I'm just really passionate about it and like I, I'm really excited to get out of bed and get straight to work. Uh, I usually wake up and, you know, brush my teeth make a cup of coffee and I'll sit down, maybe check a couple emails and then I'll get to my work for the day, whether that's like writing a script or it's the actual editing of a video. Uh, I really don't have much of a routine. I just kind of get right to it. Yeah. I think that's like what the misunderstanding of all of this is, is that no one's morning routine needs to look like someone else's for it to be legitimate. It's just what is right for you. Mm -hmm. And I, it's a, it's a beautiful luxury to enjoy your work on the level that both you and I do, where it's like, okay, what are the things I just have to hurry up and get done so I can start working on the life that I love and the work that I love doing. So even if it's just get up, have your cup of coffee, bring it to the computer and start working, like that's a routine, like that's what you do. And it just gets you started in the best way possible. Yeah. And I think I might experiment with this uh, in the future. Cause like, I mean, I've, I've read books uh, like My Miracle Morning and, mm. uh, you know, I, I certainly see the value in putting personal things first. I think it's really helpful for people who have a nine to five job uh, or perhaps have a career that they're hoping to move away from. Uh, or even if you're not to have that morning to yourself, to feel like you have some sense of control, like you can meditate, do this and that. And if you have kids and you're so busy when you get home that you're not going to be able to do things for yourself. If you're trying to write that book, like morning routines can be a super powerful way to take control of your day because there's really not much time after work to be able to do that stuff. At that point, we've already creatively exhausted ourselves uh, that the mornings can be uh, the, the best way to do that. I did experiment with like waking up at 5.30 every morning for a month. Mm -hmm. That was rough. And I found out that I really didn't enjoy it. I do wake up pretty early. Now I wake up anywhere from like 6.30 to 7 every morning. But I found that when you're too rigid with your days, when you say 5.30 every day, no matter what, seven days a week, life's going to get in the way. You're going to travel. Things are going to come up. You're going to get sick. And when you're that rigid with yourself, uh, it's going to 
I think bite you in in the long run. Yeah, I definitely think that there is a balance there. I feel like crap when I can't wake up at the time that I like to wake up because of those kinds of moving parts and things. But there's also a realization of like, oh, well, today's different. You know, as long as I get back to the thing that Mm -hmm. keeps me level on a regular basis, I feel pretty good about it. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think that there's definitely just recognizing life does happen. And if you are best at 530, then great. Like make that the pretty consistent thing. But if yeah. it's not every day, it's not going to kill you. Life happens all the time. Life happens <laughs> so much. Isn't I it crazy? Um, Mallory Days, I asked a question on Instagram of what people wanted to know. And she said, how do you deal with anxiety? Have you had any um No problem, anxiety. My life is totally that? perfect. <laughs> I haven't dealt with any anxiety at all. Uh, no, I... I have like throughout my life, I've certainly dealt with anxiety for the most part. It's been pretty mild. I had some really bad dating anxiety very early on uh, in my my career and in my life, probably from like around like 19 years old to 24 or so, where I didn't go on a date in like five years. And that was in part because it, it, it built up this anxiety, this social anxiety about dating built up over a long period of time mm. to the point where when I was three years into it, it was like it was terrifying for me to go on a date. And I just kept pushing it off. And I'm like, ah, like I'll, I'll eventually deal with it. And then, you know, it just came to a tipping point where I was like, listen, I, I, I need to actually just get out and start dating. I moved out of my parents' basement finally. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'm going to sign up. I'm on Tinder. I'm on OkCupid. I'm going to just start going on dates. And the first date was truly terrifying. Like I was like shaking the day before um, just thinking about it. But I went on a date. And it went fine. It wasn't amazing. I didn't meet the love of my life, but I, like I, I realized it wasn't that big of a deal, and I felt invincible in that moment. It's gonna sound silly, you just go on one date, but I know a lot of other people that are listening to this have experienced social anxiety or anxiety mm. in general. And the one thing that I realized from that experience was that exposure was the best way to overcome it, and delaying exposure was the worst way to sink deeper and deeper into a hole. So. I just went on more and more dates. I turned it into my job. I was like five dates a week. That's okay. I'm not trying. I'm not like a player. I'm not. I just want to go out and get coffee 30, 60 minutes a day and just make it a part of my daily routine. And then eventually I'll get over this. And I did. I completely I like, you know, you always have a little bit of jitters or a little bit of anxiety going into a date, I think, if you're a human and have a pulse. Yes. But <laughs> I, I was no longer shaking in the shower the day before. That's such a good lesson. I mean, like, even if this isn't a dating issue, just from being socialized, especially for those of us who are introverts and are always thinking like, oh, gosh, you know, when am I going to have to exert energy with a human in the near future? (laughs) And um, I think that's a fun challenge. Like, can you just go have coffee with somebody three to five times per week? Challenge yourself to do it for a period of time. So you realize from the experience, it's not that bad. And it doesn't have to be this like, you know, in dating, it's like, am I going to find the love of my life, which is a lot of pressure. High expectations. Yeah. Like that's that's a lot to deal with. Yeah. And like, how is all of this socialization going to help you when you finally meet the rock, by the way? So. Uh, that's a, that amazing <laughs> question. Yeah. I think about that every morning. Actually. <laughs> no, I, like, I don't think too much. I do have like too much rock memorabilia in my apartment. What though. is the deal with the rock and your feelings about him? OK, the rock is when I started my podcast and nobody was listening. I had 50 downloads per episode. I was just thinking, you know, what, who could I get on my show? That one exemplified a ground up story. Somebody who just works his ass off every day, continues to put in the work, uh, has come from nothing. He came from $7 and has gone so far with it and like built a career but continues to show up every day, right? So there's a lot of people that they get to a certain point and then they might just be like, okay, I can relax now, I can chill. But this dude works harder than anybody in entertainment. And then it was also just like, who by the sheer fact of getting them on my show would prove to people that anything is possible? Uh, So I was like, all right, it's gotta be The Rock. Like, I mean, I just just admire him. I admire how he shows up and how he, uh, what he puts into his craft. And I thought if I could get anybody on my podcast, like, he'd be the one that I would want to get. And I haven't gotten him yet. Oh, shoot. <laughs> no, but where I got, he tweeted at me like two or three times. 
and we're making progress. So I, maybe he's like, hmm, going to have to keep watching this Matt guy. I, don't See think how. So. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to hope so, but uh, yeah, I, I do not think that he, I don't even know. He does not know who I am. <laughs> he definitely doesn't know who I am. But the beautiful thing is that he really makes you feel special when he sends out a tweet. I saw what he tweeted to you and it was like, you had to put thought into that tweet. To, oh my God. To yeah. It's like super funny too. <laughs> like, I think he said, uh, I took a photo of, so I have a framed photo. It's actually right behind me. Oh, of, I see it. Yeah, of the, the <laughs> rock. It was like his classic. Uh, he's wearing a fanny pack and he's got a leather fanny pack. Do you know the context of that photo? I've seen it so many times and I'm like, why did that occur? The context is, uh, I think it was the 90s. Okay, <laughs> I yeah, think that that's makes pretty sense. much all there, the context that you need. <laughs> yeah, so he definitely, there was a style and it is not in style anymore. It's no longer in style. <laughs> yeah, but I mean... Uh, yeah, so he, I actually took a photo of that photo. I uploaded to Twitter and said, uh, you know, no, the rock hasn't, uh, returned my phone calls, but I'm still <laughs> trying to get him on the podcast. And then he said, I haven't returned your phone calls because you keep calling me collect. And I was like, you son of a but I was like, this is good. It's nice to be on his radar for even five seconds. That's great. And your audience just loves to see you have a little win like that. So it's like. They're surprisingly supportive of me trying to get the rock. On I my feel podcast. like if you weren't a minimalist, you would have had that tweet like really nicely printed out and also framed yeah. to put somewhere. But I think the photo of just him is really working. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. I'd love thing. to get to, into some more details about your day to day. I kind of already talked to you about your mm -hmm. morning routine. Um, but what do you do to stay active? What's your favorite way to work out? I go to the gym about five or six days a week. I have what's called the two day rule. So it's, uh, I do not allow myself to skip two days in a row. So I can, wow, I love yeah. that rule. Yeah. So it, it basically, it really stemmed from me, uh, struggling to build a gym habit in college. And I was always a very scrawny, skinny kid. Mm -hmm. I weighed about 120 to 130 pounds. And then once I did that and started to build in the two day rule, I built up this gym habit. I was actually able to gain around 20 pounds of muscle in the course of a year, uh, and just completely transform my body. Mm -hmm. So I've continued to keep that rule to this day. I will say it's not like it's not a religion. So there are times when I travel, when I get sick, even times when I just get really busy where I will break the rule. But I would say 80 to 90% of the time, I hold the two-day rule pretty strict. I go to the gym. I lift weights. Over the past three months, I've really started to develop and do a lot more cardio, mm. which has been fun. I'm, I've am i been doing like a cycling class mm. every week. I love spin. So fun. Oh, my yeah. God. It's so good. It I really did, is fun. Yeah. My wife, Natalie, brought me to Soul Cycle, which I'm sure you've done that before. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But that that was cool. I really actually enjoyed it. Workout was really intense. Uh, at my gym, they have cycling classes, so we just do them there. Yeah. And I've actually been bringing Natalie along as well. She's We've got a wedding next year, so she's trying to get in uh, wedding dress shape. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so we've been going to the gym every day. It's been a lot of fun. That's a, definitely a good learning lesson for her and me. Like Having an accountability partner is super helpful if you want to build totally. a consistent routine. Totally. Do you, I mean, do you feel like you do better with an accountability partner across the board? Or are you pretty driven I personally yourself. don't need it, although I have found that when she is around, uh, like I, I will push myself a little bit harder and she pushes me a little bit. Like when mm. it comes to like doing abs and crunches, like she'll I, where I might skip it. She won't let me skip it. Yeah, that helps out a lot. Going to the gym, uh, not as much, but for her. Uh, she definitely wouldn't be going to the gym if I wasn't there like every day being like, OK, get out of bed. We're going. <laughs> <laughs> nice. What does self-care look like for you? Uh, Self-care is just being intentional with my days and, and making sure that in the long run, I'm spending enough time on myself and my health and my well-being. So whether I'm uh, meditating for 10 minutes after a long day or I'm, you know, eating healthy and doing the right things for my body, it's, it's just putting myself first. It's kind of like putting the oxygen mask on yourself before you help other people. I think it's important to take care of yourself and, and to be happy if you want to be able to impact other lives and, and help other people. How do you happy. meditate typically? So meditation is something that I, I a habit that I've struggled, struggled to develop, I would say over the past five years, but recently I've gotten it to stick in, in a pretty real way where I did 30 days of meditating for an hour every day. And wow. it, it wasn't an hour all in one block, oh, but it, okay. yeah, because yeah. I, I don't, I would not, I don't think I would have actually been able to do that. Uh, but I broke it up like 15, 10 minutes here gotcha. there, but throughout the whole day I meditated for an hour. And, uh, so now I will generally, you know, when Nat's cooking dinner or just towards the end of the day, I'll just 
take 10 minutes. I use Sam Harris's meditation app uh, called Waking Up, which has been really great. And I just sit down for 10 minutes. I listen to the guided meditation, usually sit on a cushion with my back against a wall just to have better posture. And I try as best I can to let go of the day, let go of all the events, everything that's conspired, try to let go of my thoughts uh, and just sit still for, for 10 minutes, which definitely helps a lot. It helps to do it at the end of the workday for me. So it creates a buffer between, okay, now I'm getting into my life. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not to say that, that my work isn't my life because it certainly is, but now I'm letting work go because, you know, as a creative, I'm sure you're aware, we can very much be in our heads, staying up all night, just thinking about ideas, thinking about the things that we need to do the next Definitely. day. But to create that stillness is hugely important. Any books you've read recently that you recommend something that's helpful from a positivity mindset shift? Point yeah. Of view? A couple of books by Ryan Holiday are really good. He's got a new book coming out, but two of his previous best-selling books, Ego is the Enemy and The Obstacle is the Way. I think The Obstacle is the Way is probably one I'd recommend first, especially for people who are constantly coming up to these brick walls and they feel like their their life is always falling apart. Mm. I think will help them to understand that obstacles are part of the game. Like we're always going to have shit go wrong. There's always going to yeah. be things that uh, don't go according to plan. And the quicker we understand that, the easier it is for us to adapt and find happiness because happiness isn't about not having problems or obstacles. It's about how we face them. Yeah, I love that you suggested that. Love Ryan Holiday's work. And um, and I know Vincenzo has been telling me the obstacle is the way is a really good one. I haven't picked it up yet, so I'm definitely going to have to do that. What about podcasts? Anything you listen to? You know, I get into like binges of podcasts. Do you? Like, yeah, where sometimes... For the most part, I won't listen to any. And then I will just kind of for maybe four or five days in a month, just kind of go all in on listening to them. I love Freakonomics. That was probably one of the podcasts that got me interested in making a podcast myself mm. just because it's it's really well done. It's highly produced and super thoughtful. And it helps me with my work today where just certain topics that he covers is something that that I would be interested in and potentially exploring myself. Uh, but other than that, Tim Ferriss, obviously amazing podcast. Joe Rogan every once in a while, like he just had Bernie Sanders on. So, you know, yeah. whenever he has somebody, an interesting guest like that or Kevin Hart, I love to tune into Rogan. But yeah, those are probably the, the three mainstays for me. Awesome. I uh, would love for everybody to follow you if they have no idea what they're doing and haven't already searched for <laughs> you or seen your minimalism videos. Where can everybody find you on all things social? Yeah, I would say just go to mattdiavella.com. Uh, I mean, all my socials are Matt Diavella, but the, the links are all there. So M-A-T-T-D-A-V-E-L-L-A. Perfect. In just a couple minutes, I'd like to record the secret show with you if you're up for it. Can't wait. You guys can find that at Shine Squad. That's at patreon.com slash Amy TV. Before we do, I'll ask you my final question. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you to go after the life that you want? I think it means asking difficult questions of ourselves, trying to figure out the path that we want to set forward, putting ourselves first for even a day. Uh, I, I recommend if people have no idea where they want to go with their lives, pull out a piece of paper and write down what their ideal day might look like. Get into crazy specific detail from the moment you wake up to the time you go to bed. What does your day actually look like? And I don't think most people take the effort or the thought to think about where they want to go, the things they want to do, who they want to spend their time with. And if we're very intentional about those decisions, I think that's the, the, the quickest way to find contentment. Matt Diavella, thanks for doing the show. Thanks for having me. All right, let's catch the deets with Matt. First, I loved his tip on perfectionism and dealing with it. Give yourself boundaries or constraints. This is something that has helped me a lot, especially with calendar blocking and really understanding how much time I have at my disposal. When I understand how much time I have and I'm like, oh, that, that's not a whole lot. You can't spend months on a video to make it the best it could possibly be. You can't spend weeks on a podcast to continue to improve it. You've only got a set period of time. So it's great for people who have perfectionism issues because you're much more likely to hit the ground running, launch something, get it to its best possible form in the time that you've originally scheduled, and then you're done. I love that Matt talked about this because I think sometimes when we watch his content, it feels a little bit untouchable, like, oh, incredible filmmaking, incredible storytelling. And it's just great to know that, first of all, that took a lot of skill building 
and um, just time in the industry to get really good at it. But that maybe his best work is yet to be seen because he's very good at showing up for his audience on time and not letting perfectionism get to him. So such a good tip. Another one was when you start creating and begin sharing your work with the world, be patient and enjoy the process. You have to learn it for yourself, but it will make you appreciate the wins so much more. Like I was talking about earlier in the show, you know, overnight successes don't actually happen. There's a lot of things that go into it when they do. So remembering that as you're continuing to create and put things out in the world and no one's watching and you are absolutely the underdog like Matt talked about being, you need to be patient and enjoy the process. If you don't enjoy the process and it's all about hitting these metrics that are going to be respected by the rest of the world, you're in it for the wrong reasons. Get out, find something else that gets you happy. Also, your morning routine is not designed by the outside world. Matt feels like he doesn't have a dedicated morning routine or that he's not focused on it the same way that some other people in the self-development community are, such as myself, but he still wakes up and he has the same purpose to go after his passion every morning. And so he actually does kind of have a routine, right? He wakes up and he starts to work on the thing that he loves. If you have a routine and you have something that gets you excited to get out of bed every morning, it doesn't matter if the rest of the world says it needs to include lemon water and meditation. If it's you, then do you and have that routine that launches you into into the day on your best foot forward. And I'm so, so happy that he recommended books by Ryan Holiday. Ryan Holiday is also a Vayner speaker like myself, which is awesome. I've been reading The Daily Stoic every single day of 2019, and it is life changing. But Matt actually recommended The Obstacle is the Way, which is a great book I'm planning on picking up soon. I only know this because my husband's been saying it forever. And also Ego is the Enemy. I think Ryan really speaks from an incredible place of what it means to truly know who you are rather than to do do what everybody else thinks you should be doing or reacting in ways that are not going to be helpful for you, which is particularly why I love The Daily Stoic. So we will link to those books in the show notes. And so I hope you go and check them out. Ryan's work is really fantastic. Do you love getting advice straight to those earbuds? I'd love to share some simple steps for living your best life every day. And that is my free audio training, the seven essential details for going after the life that you want to receive this audiogram. All you have to do is review this podcast and take a screenshot to show that you have. Email that screenshot to hello at detailspodcast.com with audiogram, please, in the subject line, and I'll get that right over to you. I would love for you to share your favorite part of this podcast on the Detail Therapy Instagram. Visit at Details Podcast. Look for Matt's face and share a comment underneath with what your favorite part was. I would love to see what resonated the most with you. What should we talk more about in the future? Share that in a comment on Instagram. That's all for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate it as always. If you would like to discover even more actionable details, head over to Amy TV by visiting youtube.com slash Amy TV or searching for Amy TV in your YouTube app. Remember, subscribe for good vibes, kiss the ones you love and go after the life that you want. Cheers. Cheers.